okay? You'll hear another big word that it's called. It's called antiphon. A-N-T-I-P-H-O-N. Okay? Antiphon? Antiphon. Okay, you know what that word means? Don't get confused and don't let big words confuse you. All that word means is opposite voice. So what do you think opposite voice would be? What would mean? What would opposite voice mean? No, not 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 opposite as in that way, but but opposite as in as in direction. Okay, so this is the reader. He's standing up there on the ammo. Okay, and he's reading the word of God, and then we as a congregation are responding to him. So it's an opposite voice. So he she says something, and then she before she starts the reading, she'll say, and this this is this is the word of God. Oh, thank be to God. Right? She'll say some a line, and we all repeat it. And then she'll start the reading, and then she'll stop, and then we all reply. Then she'll go back and she'll say another verse, and then we all, as a congregation, reply. And that's the opposite voice coming back to her. Do you understand? So we are all taking part in the service. So do you understand why we do that now? Yes. Making sense? So you have to go back and teach, tell your mom all these things you learned today. You say, Mom, I know what the Mass means. Okay? Alright, so the second reading... The first reading, we called it, the first reading was taken from the Hebrew scriptures, right? Why do we call it the Hebrew scriptures? Because that was given to the Hebrews or to the Jews, okay? The second part of the book, the New Testament, we call that the Christian scriptures. Why? Because that came after Christ. So, followers of Christ called Christ, Christians, Christians, followers of Christ. Okay? Yes, everybody on board? Okay, so then we come to the gospel reading and the gospel... It always begins with the word Alleluia, right? Okay, Alleluia. So what does the word Alleluia mean? Praise God. Praise God, that's all it means. You can say Alleluia or you can say Hallelujah. Do you know that there are some, there's, every word is different in a different language, right? Yeah. Have you heard that? Every word is different in a different language. Mm -hmm. But you know that this word Alleluia is the same the whole world over. You could say it in, if I ask you to say it in Chinese or in Russian, or in English, or even in Arabic, it's the same word, Hallelujah. That word has never been translated. Okay, isn't that amazing? And what would that one word be that never gets translated? Praise God. It will always mean the same thing. Praise God. Okay, so the word gospel means, come on, I just told you this. The word gospel means? Good news. Good news. Very good. Good news. Hallelujah in Latin. Hallelujah in Hebrew. Okay. So when, the, when you hear a Jew saying it, he's going to say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. That's what it means. Praise God. In Latin, the Romans would say, Hallelujah. Okay? And uh, it's a key word in Christian worship. So we need to know what this word means and we need to remember. Okay? So, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Catholic church, okay, the, the priest or the deacon would lift up the word of God, which is the book, right? And he would be followed with by two Two who? Two altar boys. And they would be standing beside him while the deacon or the priest is holding up the, the book, which is the Bible. And the two altar boys would be holding in their hands what? They would either hold the incense or what else would they hold? Candles. So what do you think the candles would represent? Light. Light. It represents Jesus being the light of the world. Do you understand? So Jesus is shown there as a candle burning, as a light of the world. He's come to bring light in the darkness. He's come to light up our lives. Okay? And what do you think the incense is for? What do you think incense is for? If, if I show you these pictures, you're not going to forget it. That's why I'm, I know some of you look like you're not getting bored, but just try to pay a little bit of attention and you're going to understand and enjoy the Mass a lot more. Where does incense come from? Hmm? Incense originally comes from a gum. It's a resin that comes from the tree. What they do, they cut the tree and the tree starts bleeding. And it gets off like a gum, okay? And they take that gum from that tree and they make it into little round balls and then they run it through a chemical process. But basically what happens is when they put the incense on hot coals, it gets out a lot of smoke and it gives out a very pleasing smell, which, which to God, God says it's a pleasing smell. But do you know where this whole idea came from? Do you know? Okay, how many of you all remember the story of Noah? You all remember the story of Noah? You remember when God destroyed the whole earth and He only saved Noah and his family and all the animals two by two? He put them into what? 
into a ship or an ark, right? We call it the ark, right? So you know, after 40 days, when the water went down, it took a whole year for the water to go down, but it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. But after the 40 days and 40 nights, after the rain all stopped, and all the water went down, right? Noah came out of the ark with the animals, and what did he do? He sacrificed animals to God, right? Why did he sacrifice animals to God? In Thanksgiving. That was it. Just because he was offering thanks to God for saving him and his family. Okay? So what Noah, what Noah did was he cut the animal, skinned it, he put it on the altar and he burnt the whole animal. And the smell of that smoke went up to heaven. Right? So guess what God said? It says in Genesis 8.20, and I'm telling you the scripture so that you know why we are doing what we are doing with the incense. Okay? Then... Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is after the flood, okay? And Noah has been saved and he's come out into the new world. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings to the Lord. So what was a burnt offering? You had to kill the animal, clean it, and then burn it alive. Burn it, right? So he offered the burnt offering on the altar. Again, we come to the word altar, right? And what is that? Dinner table. Dinner table, right? For us, dinner table. For them, place where you would sacrifice the animals. The Lord, the Lord, who would be that being when we say the Lord? God. That would be God. So it says the Lord smelled. He smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself. So the Lord is not talking to Noah now. Who is the Lord talking to? <laughs> himself. And what is he doing when he's talking to himself? He's making a promise to himself. Right? He's not making the promise to Noah. He's not making the promise to man. Because if I make a promise to you and I tell you, if you do this, I'll do this. Right? Then it would be dependent on her doing that thing. And if she doesn't do it, then I have, I'm able to not do whatever I promise. You understand? Because if she comes and says, you said you're going to do it, but you didn't. And I can tell her, hey, you said you, you were supposed to do this, then I was going to do this. So you didn't do it. I'm not going to do it. You understand? Yes? No? Making sense? But when God talks to himself, so God, God is promising himself. So God can come back and say, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because God himself made the promise. So he has, there's no, there's no uh, uh, clause. There's no clause for him not to do it. You understand? So this is a promise God made to himself. And God says, because, he said, because, I will never again curse the ground. I will never again curse the ground on account of man. So no matter what man does, the ground will never get cursed again. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. Because he said, I've seen what man does. Man is always evil. He doesn't want to do what is good. He always wants to do what is bad. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. And why did God make that promise to himself? Because of what Noah did. When Noah sacrificed the animals to thank God for saving him. Do you understand? So, how do we, how do we offer sacrifice to God now? Because we don't, you don't come to church with a, with a lamb and take it to the altar and cut the lamb and burn it alive. So what is us, what is our sacrifice? How do we sacrifice to God? What do you think we do? We pray, exactly. That's what our, that, that is what our sacrifice is. We pray to God. So how, how many different ways can we pray? We can either petition God and ask Him for something or we can be praying, thanking Him for something. Okay, do you understand? So we either ask God for something that we need something like maybe we are sick. Can you make me healthy? Can, is my mom sick? Can you make my mom well? Or we tell God, you know, God, I prayed for something. Thank you for giving it to me. Okay? All right? Okay. So, so you understand where the, where, when we are talking about the smell? Right? And so, this is from the book of Revelation. Okay? And it says, another angel came and stood at the altar. So think, we are, in, we are at Mass right now, right? And while we are praying and the priest is burning the incense, so another angel is coming and standing by the altar. Maybe we can't see him there, but the angel is there. Okay, and stood by the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him. So basically, in heaven, the same thing's happening. An angel is standing there with a the censer. You know what the censer is, right? It's that, that little gold thing with a chain on it that they throw the uh, incense on, and then the smoke comes out. So this is what the angel is doing in heaven. So what are we doing here on earth? We are representing what the angel is doing in heaven. We are representing it down here on, on earth. Okay, so you, you understand why we are doing all these things now in the mass?
So it says that the angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar. So this is a term I've heard a lot before and it says that when the incense goes up, it's like the prayers of the saints. It is not the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints are going up with the incense. Okay? So what does the incense represent to us? What is the incense? When we are burning the incense, what is it actually symbolizing? Do you know? Our prayers. What did Noah do? He sacrificed the animal, correct? Okay. So now we are not in Noah's time. Now we are in our time, right? Or in Jesus' time. So when the, when the smoke is going up, what, 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 what sacrifice, what is being sacrificed for that smoke to go up? Who? Oh. It's Jesus' death on the cross. Okay, that's what the, what, that is what is being symbolized by that smoke. Because Jesus died. It's like as if Jesus was taken and put on the altar and he was burned alive. Okay? Or oh, he was burned to death. He was burned and that was Jesus' death that that smell is going up to heaven for. Do you understand? Okay. So, is, 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 the, is it starting to make a little sense to you? The mass? Okay. Okay, so, and the smoke of the incense it says, and the smoke of the incense, so that you, we have to make very sure we understand this. Because the smoke of the incense is representing Jesus' death, right? But the, and the prayers of the saints are going up with it, right? And now it tells us that Jesus is sitting where? At the right hand of the Father, making, making intercession for us. Making intercession for us. So Jesus is sitting at God's right hand. The prayers of the saints are coming up, right? And Jesus is taking the prayers of the saints. And He is the one who is offering it to God. Do you understand? Okay, so when we process, when the processes are made with the gospel held high, with, while the choir and the community are claiming the good news with the hallelujah, hallelujah, uh, we as Christians acclaim the most wonderful deed that God has done for humankind. You know what is the most wonderful deed that God did for humankind? Because man, man, when God created man, God created man to be in his image and his likeness. So God made man to be like God, right? But because of sin, we fell from that state of grace. So we could never be like God. So what did God choose to do? He came to be like us. Do you understand? That's what this whole thing is all about. This is what the good news of the Bible is. We could never end up being like God, even though we were created to be like Him. Because of sin, we lost that state of grace. So God chose to step down from where He was to come down to us on earth and be like us. So now becoming like one of us, He's able to take us by the hand and take us back up to where he is. You see? If a king is sitting on the throne, right, and one of his subjects comes up to him, the subject would never sit on the throne. He can never come up and take over the throne. You know why? Because that would be a use. He would be usurping the throne or trying to take over the throne and the other soldiers would come and kill him. You understand? But if the subject is there, is the king able to step down from his throne and, and sit with the subject? You see that picture now? The king can do it. Nobody can do anything to the king. Because the king can step down, but the subject cannot go and sit on the throne because it doesn't belong to him. Do you understand? The Bible is a picture. Just think of the picture. If you get this picture in your head, you'll understand. It's so amazing. God, God chose to come down to earth and live among us as one of us. He took on human form. How many of you all are Hispanic here? Do you all speak? I mean, of course, you all must be speaking Spanish at home, right? Yeah? So they use the word incarnation. It's a really big word, incarnation. Right? You know what that means? Okay, what do you think? No. Okay, think. Okay, let me ask you a question. If, what is the closest Spanish word that you can come to when you say incarnation? What? Incarnacion, but break it down. If you take the incarnacion and you take away the ion and you take away the in, okay, so what is left? Carne. What is carne? Meat. So God came down to earth because God is spirit and he put himself into meat and he came down in a body. That's what incarnation means. That God, the spirit, took on human flesh. So when we say incarnation, what are we saying? God took on a human body, he took on flesh. He came in flesh. Do you understand? He came born in the womb of Mother Mary 
and he was born through the birth canal just like every human being is in me, in flesh. So the next time you hear the word incarnation, you're going to understand what it means, right? Okay. So the gospel reading is the climax of the liturgy of the world, okay? We have to understand what we are doing when we come to church. It's not just a ritual that we sit here like we are paying penance for one hour and we say, oh God, when is this going to be over and I can get out of here. That's the way most of us think about the Mass. But if we understand what's happening in the Mass and what we are celebrating, it's going to make a lot more sense to you. The next time you come, you're going to t put your fingers in the holy water, you make the sign of the cross, you're going to remember baptism. You're going to remember, hey, hey, if I'm in the desert and there's no water and I'm dying, of thirst and if I don't get water to drink I'm gonna die that's what that water represents it represents when I'm dirty I can go take a bath in water and I get clean okay like I'm thirsty I'm drinking water I'm refreshed look at how many things water does for us right so now when you touch that bat baptismal water it'll have more sense it'll make more sense to you what we're doing when we come to the pew we kneel on which knee which knee right knee why do we kneel on the right knee because we are swearing allegiance to the king, right? You all understand, you all remember all that? When we see the priests coming with the altar boys and all of them in a procession, what is that reminding us of? What is that reminding us? It's reminding us of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem when he was sitting on the donkey and they were waving palm branches, right? And shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Okay, so when we say, when we come to the profession of faith, Right? So now we come to the profession of faith. Right? After the gospel readings, we say we profess our faith. What is the meaning of profess our faith? What, what would it mean to you to profess our faith? What would you say? Okay. So the prefix for pro, P-R-O, pro. Pro means in favor of. So we are in favor of. And fes means to claim. We proclaim our faith, right? So we proclaim the faith. So we are in favor of and we are claiming, what are we claiming? We are claiming something to be our own, right? Like say you have a purse and there's three or four people there and you come and somebody says, whose purse is that? And you come and you say, that's mine. What are you doing when you say that's mine? Yes, You're claiming it, right? That is yours. So when we proclaim our faith or we profess our faith, we are pro, we are in favor of and we are claiming that that is mine. That's why we say the I believe. Do you understand? This is why we say the I believe. It's also called the creed. The creed is our, creed means belief. Okay, so creed means belief and we are, we, are, we are saying that this, I'm claiming that this is what I believe in. This is what I believe, okay? That's why it's called the profession or 